Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Or uh, shall I say COVID-free uh, afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, Nilo, Dean Nilo Divina. Uh, it will be my pleasure to walk you through the highlights of revised corporation. Let's start. First slide, please. Okay, uh, first let's take a look at the historical background of the revised corporation code. It was um, approved by Congress on February 20, 2019. It's a very meaningful date for me because it coincided with my birthday. So I was born February 20. So Congress uh, approved the revised corporation code on the same birthday and uh, become, became effective February 23, 2019 upon publication in two newspapers of general circulation, uh, Manila Bulletin and Business Mirror. Now, the law promotes ease of doing business. So let's talk about the basic features or characteristics of the revised corporation code. It promotes ease of doing business. That's why you have provisions on uh, one person corporation that allows persons to put up corporate entities and yet limited in liability. So one person putting up a corporation, but limited liability is so far as that is contribution to the corporation is concerned. And then you have the rule on perpetual existence. So there's no need to keep on renewing the term of the corporation. So unless you forget, so there's no need to, ex to extend the term of the corporation. So corporations shall exist until the board directors and stockholders decide to end it. And then of course, you also have um, the provision regarding dispensing with the requirements for subscription and payment upon incorporation. As you all know, under the old corporation code, when you incorporate, you have to subscribe to at least 25% of the authorized capital stock and pay one fourth or 25% of the subscription. That is not true anymore. You can put up the corporation without being bothered how much will be your subscription and paid up capital. It's only when you increase your capital stock that you have to comply with a 25% subscription and payment requirement. And then it also adopted best practices on good corporate governance. That's why the revised corporation code requires that the notice of the meeting, the agenda of the stockholders meeting must contain certain information, all in the interest of promoting transparency. And third, it afforded greater protection to minority stockholders. In what sense? It widened the list of documents and books that the corporation must keep in its principal office for inspection of stockholders. And then it afforded likewise remedies, additional remedies to a stockholder in case he's denied the right of inspection. And now, as under the old code, before the present uh, revised cooperation code, you only have two remedies in case your, your right of inspection is denied or enacted upon by the corporation. You can file a criminal complaint for violation of right of inspection. You can file a petition to inspect corporate books under the rules of intercorporate controversy. Under the RCC, you have a third remedy. You can report to the SEC the inaction or denial of the corporation. And within five days from that report, the SEC must conduct summer investigation and it order the corporation to, to allow you to inspect and examine the books of the corporation. And then fourth, it codified internationally accepted practices and norms on conducting business. That's why you have uh, the use of technology. You can send notices of meetings electronically and you can participate electronically or in absentia based on guidelines have be issued by the SEC. And lastly, it strengthened the powers of the SEC so that it can exercise uh, effective supervision and jurisdiction over all corporations. Uh, later on, we'll discuss that the RCC contains acts that are considered criminal in nature. Under the old code, there was only one offense. That is violation of right of inspection. Under the RCC, you have so many acts that will constitute criminal offenses. So let's take a look now at the provisions one by one. 
uh, because of the limited time, so for these are highlights of the, the revised cooperation code, the revisions contained here that I will discuss more or less account for 90% of the entire provisions, but these are the most important revisions or, or features other of the revised cooperation code. Let's start with section seven uh, on founder shares. Now, just to refresh your memory, what are founder shares? These are shares that are classified as such in the articles of incorporation and given certain rights and privileges. If that privilege consists of the right to vote or be voted as directors, it's effective for a period of five years from incorporation. It used to be five years from approval of the SEC, now five years from incorporation. What does it mean? If the founder shares will be included as an amendment to the articles of incorporation, then the five-year period is reckoned not from the amendment, but incorporation of the corporation. Unlike before, five years of approval of the SEC. Now, also under the uh, RCC on founder shares, the RCC made very clear that founder shares should not be used to circumvent the rules and laws on anti-dummy and the uh, law related to foreign investment, in what sense? Now, um, you know that founders of, or holders of founder shares can be voted as directors, regardless of the number of their shares in the corporation. So that's the right granted to them. So no matter how insignificant their shares may be, they're entitled to be voted as directors for a period of five years. Now, let's say, that the corporation is a public utility. And under the constitution, as you know, 60% of the capital of the public utility must be owned by Filipinos. It's partly nationalized activities. Let's say there are 15 directors, or let's make 10, 10 directors. And uh, foreigners own 40% of the public utility corporation. That means that they can be represented in the board up to 40% of 10 directors. They're entitled to four because the right to uh, participate, the right to be elected as directors is in proportion to their shareholdings in the corporation. So let's say they have 40% of the equity of the public utility. So they can get four board seats. What if two foreigners have found their shares? Can those two foreigners get themselves elected as directors on top of the 40% that would be voted to for or vote for directors? Not allowed because it will circumvent or violate the anti dummy law in the Foreign Investment Act. Now, second also, uh, we said that um, if the privilege granted to holders of founder shares is the right to vote or be voted as directors is good only for a period of five years, right? From incorporation. What about this one? Let's say the articles of incorporation provides that for every one share, the holder of the founder shares gets 10 votes. One share, 10 votes. Is that subject to the five-year limitation under the RCC? And the S is said, no, because the only right that is subject to the five-year period or limitation is the right to vote or be voted as directors. All other rights and privileges are not subject to any five-year restriction. It depends on the term provided in the articles of the corporation. One more. Let's say the holders of the foundry shares are given the right to receive dividends ahead of the preferred shareholders. And it does not contain any period. So can they get dividends that ahead of the preferred shares and common shares holders? And the answer is yes. Because to repeat, the five-year limit only applies to the right to vote, be voted as director of the company. Next slide, please. Let's move on to section 10. Now, if you ask me what are the standout provisions of the revised cooperation code, uh, the most standout provisions, I would say two, the rule on perpetual existence, and second, one person cooperation. Under section 10, let's talk about numbering qualifications of incorporators. 
Uh, can you make it bigger, please? Make it bigger. Uh, slight small. Okay, that's good. Uh, under the old corporation code, as you know, uh, only natural persons are allowed to be in corporators. Not less than five, not more than 15 in corporators. And natural persons. Okay. RCC, remove the qualifications of natural persons. Residency requirement. Minimum number of five. No more. So even a corporation now or a partnership can be an incorporator. One person can be an incorporator. That's why you have one person corporation. Okay. Um, now, what if, what if the incorporator is a partnership? So how will the partnership be an incorporator of a corporation? Of course, the, uh, there ought to be uh, approval from the partners to authorize the investment in that uh, corporation and designating who will be the representative or nominee of the partnership in the corporation. What about corporation? Same. The corporation must adopt a resolution that is majority of the entire board and stockholders only at least two thirds of the outstanding capital stock, authorizing the investment and designating the person who will act as incorporator or a nominee of the incorporator corporation. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, stop there. All right. Um, now, you know that the first incorporators are usually directors of the corporation, right? Okay. If an incorporator is a corporation, how can it perform the functions of a director? Is it not that only natural persons can participate in discussion, deliberations? So how can a juridical person like a corporation be an incorporator, say, a director of the corporation? Okay, so should the nominee of the corporation, incorporator slash director, be a stockholder or member likewise of the corporation? Uh, before the RCC, Supreme Court said in the case of Lean versus Moldex, the nominee of the corporation cannot qualify as a director unless he's also a stockholder of the corporation. And a, a member, uh, the nominee of the corporation cannot be trustee of a non stock corporation unless he's also a member of the non stock corporation. What about under RCC? Is it necessary that the nominee of the corporation be a member or stockholder likewise of the corporation? Is he qualified to be elected as director? And the SEC said, no. So the corporation as incorporator can be represented obviously by a natural person, designated by the board. That natural person would be the one to participate in discussion, acting as nominee of the corporation as incorporator. He's not the director, it is the corporation, but through the natural person nominee of the corporation. Therefore, that nominee is not qualified to be elected as a director, and he also owns one share of stock in his name in the books of the corporation. Next, please. Okay, I have discussed that. Next. Okay, next. Uh, stop there. Uh, other than a one person corporation, can a corporation, I, uh, you know, I have been asked this question many times because the number of incorporators was taken out as a qualification for incorporators. Can you have incorporators less than five? Less than five. You have rules on one person corporation, right? So can you have a corporation with two? Yes, of course. Because you know, don't have a minimum anymore. But it's not good to have two. How do you break the tie? So that but add number, right? So can you have three? Yes, except if the law requires a certain number of incorporators and directors like banks. Banks and general banking law must have not less than five, not more than 15 incorporators and directors, except in case of merger, they can have 21 directors. And banks are not allowed to organize as a one person corporation. Okay, let's now move on to section 11 on corporate term. As you know, 
uh, corporations organized under the revised corporation code shall have perpetual existence unless the articles provide otherwise. So don't think that corporations organized under the RCC automatically have perpetual existence. No, you have the option as a fixed term or perpetual existence. But if it is silent, you have perpetual existence. What about corporations organized prior to the effectivity of the revised corporation code? What happens to them? And this is the rule. They are deemed extended. So automatically they have perpetual existence. So there, there's automatic conversion from term to perpetual existence without having to amend the articles of incorporation. So no need to amend the articles, no need to call a stockholders meeting, get two thirds of the signing capital stock and board meeting, get majority of the board uh, to approve the extension, no? It's been extended unless the stockholders by a vote of majority of the standing government stock elect to retain their term as prescribed in articles of incorporation and makes it known to the SEC. But if they don't do anything, it's been extended. Automatic conversion, as I said, from term to perpetual existence. Okay, question. What about the rights of stockholders? That's the orders. They're not in favor of perpetual existence. They can exercise their appraisal right. And this is my, my, my opinion. This is what I think. Because there is automatic conversion from term to perpetual existence. Anytime a stockholder may demand the payment of the fair value of his shares. It is when the stockholders elect to retain the term that the stockholders not in favor uh, are entitled to exercise their price right. So if the stockholders don't do anything, it's deemed extended. A stockholder not in favor may exercise his price right. They want the payment of the fair value of his shares. Just to refresh your memory, under Section 80 of the Corporation Code, there are certain acts by which you can exercise your appraisal right. And appraisal right, again, to refresh our memory, is the right of the stockholder to demand the payment of the fair value of his shares after the sending against a proposed corporate act in the cases specified by law. All right. So there has to be a stockholder's meeting, right? And you will dissent or vote against the proposed corporate act under Section 80. But under Section 11, because the term is deemed extended, if the corporation does not do anything, then any time the stockholder can demand the payment of the fair value of the share. As I said, it's when the stockholders elect to retain their term that the stockholders are entitled to exercise their price right. Now, question, another question. What about non-stock corporation? It's deep extended, right? They extended. Are they entitled to exercise their price right? in non-stock operation? And the answer is no, because there is no appraisal right in non-stock operation. Now, uh, why, why do I say that there's a appraisal right in non-stock operation? Number one, the right of the members of a non-stock operation to the assets of the corporation can be exercised only upon dissolution of the corporation. And or to the extent that their distributive rights are defined in the articles of the corporation. So when you return the members the contribution, you're violating the features of a NASDAQ corporation. The assets can be given to them only upon dissolution and only to the extent that their rights are defined in the articles of the corporation. Second reason, take a look at section 15 on amendment to the articles of the corporation. It says there's a price right, right? But that sentence on a price right refers only to stock operation, not to non-stock operation. And third, on perpetual existence, it says the stockholders are entitled to exercise their, the prejudice to exercise the price right by the stockholders, not by the members of a non-stock operation. So that's, that's, those are the reasons why there is no price right in non-stock operation. Okay, um, another amendment under Section 11, before 
uh, you can extend the term within, I mean, you can extend the term um, by, by board of, board of the board, SAC order approval likewise, but you have to do it uh, not less than five years prior to original expiration. Now, under the RCC, three years. You can only extend three years before its actual expiration, uh, original or subsequent expiry date. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, can you backtrack to section 11, please? Section 11, section 11. Okay, more, okay, next. Okay, now a uh, section, this item number five in our notes. Uh, <coughs> if the term has expired, so as I said that you have two options either perpetual existence or one with a specific term. Uh, if the term expires under the old code, ipso facto, the corporation is dissolved. By ipso facto, meaning by virtue of that fact that the term expired, it is automatically dissolved. So no need for a co warrant proceeding, no need to uh, get approval of the stockholders and the board directors, ipso facto, it is expired. Under the RCC, they remove the ipso facto dissolved phrase. Why? Because the corporation is given the option to file a petition for revival of corporate existence. Okay, you can file a petition, as I said, for revival of corporate existence. And once approved by the SEC, so the corporation will be deemed revived, certificate of revival of existence. Uh, will be uh, issued by the SEC, giving the corporation perpetual existence unless the application for the Bible provides. Okay, therefore, um, if the term, the specific term in the articles of the corporation, and the term has expired, what are your remedies? Number one remedy, petition, to revive the term of the corporation. To revive the corporation. Second, reincorporation. Let me explain. The first one is revival of corporate existence. But if you have a petition for revival of existence, you're subject to liabilities, fines and penalties. So whatever the liabilities the corporation had to pay, let's say non-filing of general information share, non-filing of financial statements. no. So you compute, you have to pay this obligation before you can get uh, your revival of corporate existence. The other option is you may reincorporate. You can put up a corporation by the same name, the same purpose, same incorporators. All right. Now, what happens to the properties of the dissolved corporation. Are they transferred automatically to the new corporation? What well, the answer is now, right? Because uh, the corporation is dissolved, it's defunct. The assets could have been moved to the new corporation, obviously, unless you have liquidation uh, procedure. So how will the assets now of the defunct corporation be moved to the new corporation? The Supreme Court said in Chuk, Cabio versus IAC 163 scrap. The stockholders of the defunct corporation can assign the right to these properties as their contribution to the new corporation. So that's how they get moved to the new corporation. So do your math. Which one is cheaper for you? The petition to revive existence, you compute the penalties and the fines, or do you just put up a new corporation? Because if you put up a new corporation, if you reincorporate, there's liquidation. And based on an arrangement between SEC and BAR, you have to pay the taxes uh, as a result of the liquidation. Because there will be conveyance of assets to the stockholder, you have to pay the corresponding taxes. So I say that if the corporation has no major assets, right? 
you're better off, no? Um, of course, uh, just pre-incorporating. Or if there are no us, you're better off pre-incorporating. You only pay filing fee. But if the corporation made your asset, so many assets, you're better off petition for revival because you're not subject, obviously, to, to uh, income tax, no? When you don't, anyway, dissolve the corporation. And you simply um, ask the asset to revive it, then you pay the corresponding penalties and subject to liabilities that I mentioned about. Okay. Next. Now, let's go on to section 12. Section 12, there's a, a minimum capital stock. As I said a while ago, the RC is dispensed with minimum subscription and paid up requirement upon incorporation, except as provided by special law. So for a private corporation governed by special law, as I said, you are not subject to a 30% subscription and 30% payment requirement. It's when you increase your capital stock that you're subject to a subscription of 30% of the increase and you have to pay 20% of the increased capital stock. Okay. Section 13. On articles of incorporation, uh, first point, the articles of incorporation may provide for arbitration agreement. So what is the significance of having arbitration agreement in the articles of incorporation? Now, as you know, dispute between or among stockholders, among themselves, that is, or stockholders cooperation, uh, subject to the rules of intercorporate controversy, right? You have to file the complaint in the uh, RTC of the city where the principal office is located. If there's an arbitration agreement in the articles of the cooperation, any recourse to the court for intercorporate dispute is premature or will be premature unless you have exhausted the arbitration procedure spelled out in the articles of incorporation. So it's one layer, right, that you have to comply with before you can seek court intervention. If you go to court without exhausting arbitration procedure, the cause of action is premature. It will lead to its dismissal. And then uh, second, the articles of incorporation or amendment can be uh, in electronic form. Now, those of you who are in practice know that even before the RCC, a filing of the articles has been done electronically. But the RCC crystallized it. It made, made it a part of a statute that you can submit your um, articles in electronic form. Now, third, also very important, the articles of incorporation must contain an undertaking to change the corporate name upon the secret right, of, uh, of no, upon the notice from the SEC. If it turns out after incorporation that the corporate name approved by the SEC is not distinguishable from a name reserved or registered for the use of another corporation, or the name as approved by the SEC is contrary to law or rules or regulations of the SEC. Estoppel does not rise against the SEC. Now, you, the practitioners, when you apply for incorporation, you all know the first thing you do is to uh, verify if your proposed corporate name is uh, acceptable, uh, approved by the SEC. So they have a database of corporate names, right? And your, your, your proposed corporate name must be distinguishable from other corporate names. Used to be must not be identical or similar with existing registered or reserved corporate name. Now, the magic word is distinguishable from a corporate name reserved or registered for the use of another person. So, going back to what I said, the articles must contain an undertaking to change the corporate name in the event that after approval by the SEC, it turns out it's not distinguishable from a name registered or reserved for the use of another person. Uh, let me let me cite an example. One of our clients, uh, My Health Corporation, it owns many clinics uh, in Manila. They have one in um, in um, Mega Ball in uh, Shangri-La Festival Mall. They also have one in Cebu and Dabao. Anyway, 
we help put up the cooperation. The name is My Health Cooperation. After a few years, some operations became profitable. Another group, uh, they organized a cooperation. It's My Dot Health Cooperation. My Dot Health. Ours, My Health. The other one's My Dot Health Cooperation. So they made it techie, the My Dot Health. So the only distinction is the dot, my dot, um, health dot co. So when the client told us that uh, there is this uh, cooperation with the same uh, name, my dot health, no, they ask um, our opinion on what we should do to stop that cooperation from adopting or using uh, my dot health because it competes with our business, our client's business. So what did this remedy? We filed a petition for co warranto against that cooperation. So we file a complaint against that cooperation? No. We only file a petition with the SEC to direct that cooperation to change its corporate name because its name is identical with the name of our client. A client acquired a prior right over the corporate name because it registered it ahead of everybody else. So the subsequent user, of course, has no right to it. So we just file a petition to compel the cooperation to change corporate name. And the SEC acted on our petition favorably. On the strength of the undertaking by every applicant for incorporation at the time to change the corporate name if it is not similar or if it is, if it is similar or identical with another corporate name. Now that affidavit is now part of the articles of incorporation. The template articles of incorporation includes the language on the undertaking to change the corporate name. Okay, four, I think I have discussed that. Next, please. Okay, no, stop there. Uh, number five, so as I said, there's no need to, remember when you, before, when you incorporate, you have the affidavit, about the treasurer, he must uh, state under oath that uh, uh, 20% of the auto scabbers have been subscribed and 20% has been paid back in cash or property received by the corporation. So no need for treasure of the David uh, in, that, in that regard. So there'll be certification on the amount of subscription payment, but treasure of the David, as we all know before, is no longer part of the requirements. Next, please. <coughs> okay, on corporate name, 717. So there are detailed guidelines and more requirements for a corporate name. So many guidelines were added and the SEC now has the power summarily to order the corporation to cease this from using corporate name. We did not observe the guidelines approved by the SEC. If the corporation refuses, there will be corresponding criminal, civil, and administrative liability and sanctions. All right. And now, as I said, the primary basis now for allowing corporate name is it's not uh, distinguishable or it is distinguishable from another corporate name. It used to be, uh, it has to be, it should not be identical or confusing similar with another corporate name. Now that the keyword is distinguishable from other corporate name. Now let's take a look at the guidelines. So the SEC issued a uh, circular on the guidelines on uh, corporate recently issued. Let's take a look. There are many, but I will just choose the, what I think are the most interesting ones. The first, this is not known to many, no? Uh, the corporate name shall contain the word corporation or incorporated or their abbreviation. Okay. You know, I've mentioned this to my students. Um, when I, when I, we act, when, when Equitable and PCI Bank merged. So for the, the quandary, one of the many uh, questions that had to be resolved, what would be the name of the uh, surviving corporation? Surviving corporation was Equitable Bank. Um, but at that time, Equitable was smaller compared to uh, PCI Bank. But Surviving Bank is Equitable. So it had to be Equitable and then add PCI to Equitable. We gave Equitable PCI Bank until it was merged, it was merged with Banco de Oro. So we prepared the articles of incorporation, the plan of merger, articles of uh, merger. The plan of merger, of course, specifies the name of the surviving corporation. It says Equitable PCI Bank. Right. I submitted the documents to the SEC. After a few days, Director Benny Cataran, good friend of mine, called me up. At that time, he was the director for company monitoring and registration department. 
God niya, I mean, Neil, there's a problem with your papers. What, what problem? Uh, you did not include the word cooperation or incorporated as part of FNOP Shaibang. Oh my God, I said, oh, no. So what do I do? So at the back of my mind, I was thinking, because as you know, if you have to amend the plan of merger, you have to go back to your board and stockholders of board corporations in meetings called separately for a purpose. You have to get board approval, majority of the board of both uh, constituent corporations. And stockholders approvals, again, board corporations in meetings called separately for a purpose. And just to amend the name to include incorporated the corporation is very embarrassing. So, you know, good thing that Benny is a good friend of mine. You know, works for us, by the way, one of our consultants for corporation law. Uh, said, okay, Nino, ganda lang gawin natin. Padala ko sa iyo mga papers, ha? Ilagay mo na lang ink, dagdag mo na yung INC, intercorrect mo yung INC, ekonom piso yung bank ink, handle na lang, and then authenticate with your full customary signature. So I did. I intercalated the word INC with my full customary signature return to the SEC approved. So nobody knows that except my students and those who attend my lectures. My equitable piece of bank, Banco de Oro, of course, do not know those details. Okay, also, if you don't want personal cooperation, you have to add OPC. If you're a foundation, you have to add the word foundation. Scroll down, down. Let's just choose the interesting ones. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, number four. In fact, this is very interesting. Um, can the corporation had a corporate name, at the same time, a business or trade name. Like a corporation, ABC corporation doing business and trading style of, let's say so-and-so. It's allowed by the SEC. So your corporate name can have a business or trade name at the same time, as long as it's in the articles, of course, of the corporation. Next. Okay, uh, oh, eight, number 12, okay, there you go. Now, this one is very interesting. I have, I have to point it out because this is different from jurisprudence. In what sense? Under, excuse me, jurisprudence, the case of uh, Indian Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines and Filipino, versus Filipino Indian Chamber of Commerce, among, among difference, uh, is a Indian Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines. It's a naman Filipino Indian Chamber of Commerce. Pero parehong, Filipino Indians no? uh, engaged in business in the Philippines. The president is a good friend of mine, uh, Rex Dariani, one of our clients, likewise. Anyway, um, so sabi ng Supreme Court sa case niyan, uh, you can adopt the name of a defunct corporation three years after its dissolution. Okay, so three years after the dissolution. But during the liquidation period, you cannot adopt that name of the defunct corporation without the approval of the last stockholders owning at least majority of the signed government stock. So during three year period of liquidation, get the approval of the last stockholders owning majority of the signed government stock. After three years, no need to get approval, right? So the SEC rules just came out recently, five years. So you get use for five years. This is different from jurisprudence. This one is three, but this one is five. But you have to follow the SEC because it's a circular that they issue. So you cannot ad adapt the name of a defunct corporation within five years after its dissolution. During the five year period, get the approval of stockholders only this majority of the standing government staff. Next. Okay, now uh, this one, point 15. The reservation notice of availability of name. So, Alibawa, uh, nagpa reserve ka ng pangalan. So sabi ng, ng nag-return ng verification slip, approved ng SEC. Yan ba'y uh, approval na to use the name automatically? No? Well, hindi. Dahil the SEC later on ba, can ask you to change the corporate name if it turns out that um, it is not distinguishable from an existing corporate name. So for the purpose of cooperation, that will do. But the SEC reserves all the time uh, the authority to order you to change it. If it turns out later on that it's not distinguishable from a name registered or served for the use of another person. Okay, point 16. Um, 
what if the SEC examiner denies your proposed corporate name? What is your remedy? For resolved by the CMRD, and then decision of the CMRD appealable to the M Bank to the Office of General Counsel. Now, number 17, uh, it says here based on the circular of the SEC, you can either have an affidavit to change the corporate name as part of the document you have to submit to the SEC when you incorporate, or it's part of the, uh, the undertaking is part of the articles of the corporation. Now, I find this uh, unnecessary. Why? Because your template articles of incorporation, section 14, contains the undertaking to change the corporate name. So there's only for an affidavit to change the corporate name if it's part anyway of the articles of the corporate name. Next, please. Okay, next. Okay, here. What are the remedies available to a corporation against that authorized use of the corporate name? Somebody uh, adopts or using the corporate name. Number one, file a petition with the SEC to compel the corporation to change its corporate name because it's not distinguishable from a name registered or for the use of another person. Remember the case of Lyceum, Lyceum, um, Lyceum of the Philippines, TAF. No? And there are many Lyceums all over the country. Latest count 28. You have Liceo de Cagayan, Liceo de San Pablo, Liceo de Pangasinan, Liceo de Cabuya, no? there are many of them. And the uh, Liceum of the Philippines, the one at top, would like to, well, basically ask SE to, to direct those uh, schools to change or drop the name Liceum as part of the school of corporate name. And what was the remedy pursued by the by LSU? It, did not, it never filed an action in court for co warrant or what? It just filed a petition with the SEC to direct those schools and corporations to drop the name LSU. That was the remedy chosen. Of course, they did not win. Supreme Court said LSU is generic, cannot be appropriated by any, any person or institution. But that's the remedy that you choose or that you avail of. Petition with the SEC to change the direct the corporation to change corporate name. Uh, back, please backtrack, uh, sir. Okay. On the remedies. All right. So first remedy, file a petition with the SEC. Second remedy, file a complaint, a complaint against an authorized use of the corporate name under 159 of the RCC. There's a penalty. It's, there's monetary fine against an authorized use of the corporate name. One of the criminal offenses under the revised corporation code. And third, if the corporate name is used as a trade name, you can sue for infringement of trade name. Now, as you know, in the case of Coffee Partners versus Francisco Coffee 2010 decision, Supreme Court said uh, trade name need not be registered with the intellectual property with the IP, Director Property Office. Unlike trademark that will be registered with the IPO, trade name need not be registered with the IPO. So in case of an authorized use of a trade name, you can sue for trade name infringement. Now, where do you register a trade name? DTI, if you're a sole proprietorship, and SEC, if you're a corporation. So if a corporate name is also a trade name, as I, say, as I said, you can sue also for infringement of trade name. Next. Okay, this is a very interesting case. I, I have to add this. Uh, are Lyceum and Dilasal generic words that cannot be appropriated? What do you think? Um, so they have different rulings. Supreme Court said Lyceum is generic, uh, generic word for uh, school or education institution or facility for learning. It cannot be appropriated. What about the sal? You have the lasal, the sal, the lasal owned by the the sal brothers, and you have uh, the lasal Montessori, no? In in somewhere in the north. Okay. The argument dong sa north, kasi the complaint the lasal the lasal sa tough, no? The argument ng uh, ng the lasal Montessori sa north, 
Eh, sabi niya, pareho lang yun. Eh, yung lesi yung nga, sabi niya, talaga niya populated. Derasal is a French word for for classroom. So, no one can appropriate De La Salle. And Supreme Court said wrong because De La Salle is not generic. It is arbitrary. So, it's possible, whimsical and arbitrary. Arbitrary marks can be appropriated and registered. Like papa, no? papa for ketchup. It is arbitrary. Now, why is it arbitrary? Sabi ng Supreme Court, ano ba connection ng, ng uh, classroom no? sa education institution at saka brand of service? No? Right? I mean, you need to have you need to have creativity uh, for you to link no? the word room with education institution. So in that sense, it is arbitrary and can be appropriated. Next. Okay. Section 25. 21, effects of non-use of corporate charter. Okay, as you all know, under the old code, you have two years to organize, right? Under the new RCC, five years to organize and commence business. If you don't organize and commence within five years, deem revoke. Certificate of cooperation deem revoke, you lead to the solution of the cooperation. Now, what if you commence business, you, you are organized, you commence business, and suddenly you stop? So if you're not in operation for a continuous period of five years, you can be declared after Northern hearing in a delinquent status. So it's not automatic. So, so if you don't organize and commence business within five years, deem revoke, right? Now, the other way around, you start business, but you be came in operate, uh, not you became, you stopped operations continuously for a period of five years, not deem revoke. Why? Because the SEC of the notice hearing can only place you, may place you in delinquent status. And if you're placed on delinquent status, you have two years to resume operations and comply with the requirements of the SEC. If you don't assume operations and comply with the requirements of the SEC, then that's the time that you will be dissolved. It will lead to the revocation of the corporate franchise. Okay, there's this case um, where is a corporation considered or SEC opinion the formal organized commerce business. So those who like, those who are putting up operations, keep telling their clients. Next slide, please, Sarah. So dapat ito yung gawin nyo. Sabi ng SEC, you have to adopt your bylaws. The board must elect the officers. Uh, the board should register uh, the corporate name, business name of the TTI. Register yourself the BIR, SSS, and establish an, an office and start the business of the so these things you have to do so that you consider to have organized and commence business. Okay, I have taken it up. Section 32. Zoom on to 22. On board of directors and trustees, the term of trustee, as you know, modified for a period that exceeding three years. Of course, uh, directors, the term is still one year. Uh, as you see later, they remove the batching of trustees for non-stop operation. There is no resident requirement for members of the board. Uh, the RC requires the election of independent directors. And if they be a stockholder to be elected as independent director of a stock operation, but you don't have to be a member of a non-stop operation to be elected as independent trustee under Section 91 of the Revised Corporation Code. So for stock operation, the independent director must be a stockholder. For a non-stock operation, the independent trust should need to be a member of the corporation. Okay, also, uh, the, the RCC enumerated the corporation that are required to have independent directors. So who are they? So those required to have independent directors. Basically, uh, number one, public companies. Public companies, when are you a public company if your shares are traded the stock exchange, right? Second, if your asset is at least 50 million pesos, 
and 200 stockholders each stockholder okay uh it's so hot here so it's not coronavirus all right so it's just so hot here um so whether a public company if you register if your shares are, are um, traded in stock exchange listen to stock exchange or even do not listen to stock exchange you have assets of at least 50 million pesos with 200 stockholders minimum and each stockholder owning 100 shares each. So 50 million assets, at least 200 stockholders, each stockholder owning 100 shares each, then you are um, a public company. So what do you do? So you don't have to be a public company and you're subject to the requirement of having the bank director. Get only 199 stockholders para hindi ka public company. Who else are uh, corporations that are best in public interest? Financial intermediaries like banks, quasi banks, non stock and loan association, ponches, printed companies, uh, those engaged in money service, trusts, and insurance companies. And other corporations considered best in public interest are determined by the SEC. Okay, question. What if you have five directors. Five directors. The RCC says 20%, right? You have five. So how many are required to have? One or two? One or two? Because for bank and the general bank alone, they should have 20% of number of directors, but not less than two. Now, I would say for banks, those cover special laws, it has to be not less than 20%, but not less than 2%. Okay, now this has been very interesting. Uh, I was asked you know, this question so many times. So how do you vote? If you have independent directors, you're required to have independent directors. Let's say uh, 10 directors of the corporation, two are required to be independent directors. So how do you vote? How many votes can you cast to determine who are your regular directors and dependent directors? And the SEC issued an opinion on segregate casting of votes for regular directors and independent directors. What do we mean by regular cast, segregate casting of votes for regular and independent directors? Now, as you know, independent directors must have qualifications not enjoyed by nominees for regular directors. Apart from their shareholdings and fees, no? they're, not, they're not part of management, not subject to any circumstance that may interfere, interfere with the exercise of their judgment as director of the company. Okay, that's so why if you're a counsel of the corporation, you're gonna be an independent director. If you're a controlling stockholder, you're gonna be an independent director. If related to the controlling stockholder, you're gonna be an independent director. If you're counsel, advisor, trustee, you're going to be independent director. All right. Now, let's say you have 10. Uh, how would you choose now who are regular, who are independent? And this is what the SEC said. A stockholder can cast as many votes as he wants based on the shares of stock in his name multiplied by number of directors to be elected, inclusive of independent directors. So, for example, you have 1,000 votes or 1,000 shares. You have 10 directors. Eight regular to independent. If you have 1,000 shares, 10 directors to be elected, you have 10,000 votes, right? Those 10,000 votes can be cast in favor of one nominee. You can accumulate all of your votes uh, for one nominee for regular or one nominee for independent, or you can just use your votes for regular uh, directors or only among independent directors, or you can distribute your votes as you please among regular independent directors, as long as it does not exceed the stock name multiplied by the number of directors to be elected. Okay. And based on this opinion, the top eight vote getters among the nominees for regular directors are elected as regular directors. And the top two nominees among the nominees for of the pen directors may be less than the votes of the ninth and 10th nominee for regular directors. That has been affirmed by the SEC. 
on uh, requirement of citizenship, as you know, so there's a requirement to be a Filipino, uh, to be a director of a corporation. Foreigners can be elected to the board of a corporation, except those engaged in nationalized activity with a part in wholly nationalized. If it is wholly nationalized, foreigners, no, no, they can be elected, they can be elected to the board. If it's partly nationalized, like uh, public utility, uh, mining, exploration of natural resources, they can own up to 40% of the capital of those corporations, then they can be represented to the board to the extent of their actual foreign equity. Okay, let's move on to election of directors. <coughs> All right. Um, the right of a stockholder to nominate a director is subject to the rights of the holders of the founder shares. Now this um, very clear. No? So the right of a stockholder to nominate a director subject to the rights of the holders of the founder shares. Why? As I said a while ago, if you are holders of founder shares, you have the right to be voted as directors regardless of your shareholdings in the corporation. Now, those of, those of you in the practice, you know that there's a minimum number of uh, shares to be assured of a board seat, right? I mean, if you don't have the shares and votes, you cannot get a seat. But for holders of founder shares, regardless of their shareholdings, they get elected as directors. So if we have five holders of founder shares, 15 to be elected, it means that only 10 are up for grabs. The five are seated in favor of the holders of the founder shares. Now, point number two, regarding presence during stockholders meeting, uh, you can, what are the modes of presence under the old corporation code? You only have two, right? In person or by proxy, right? Person by proxy. Under the RCC, you can be present electronically. You can be present in absentia. So how can you present in absentia? Well, the law allows it. But based on guidelines to be issued by the SEC, as of today, there are no guidelines yet. So the SEC said 2019 opinion, this provision is not self-executory. You need to have guidelines from the SEC on electronic presence, meaning voting electronically or in absentia, right? They, there ought to be guidelines from the SEC so they had to be in the bylaws of the corporation based on guidelines of the issue by the SEC. As of today, there are no guidelines yet. But for those that are vested in public interest, the law says very clearly, even though it's not in the bylaws, they have the right to electronic presence or voting. So for those that are vested in public interest, it need not be in the bylaws. So they can avail of the prerogative or remedy under the RCC. Next. Next, please. Next. Next, next, next slide, sir. Okay, now it's a very interesting question. Uh, ito yung mga, yung mga course, may, may problema ganito, okay? Mga law students dyan. No? Paano kung hindi magkaroon ng quorum. Ang hirap makakuha ng quorum sa stockholders meeting, no? Um, or a members meeting. Nakatatlong notice ka na, walang umate, walang sumisipot, walang interested. Okay, ano, ano nga mangyayari dyan? So as you know, the term of a director is one year, right? Until success, elected, and qualified. Uh, sa pag walang meeting, anong gagawin? So section 33, introduce the concept of emergency quorum. What do I mean? Okay. Uh, you have your, your annual stockholders meeting. For whatever reason, it did not push through. So under the SRC, or RCC, I'm sorry, you have to report, report to the SEC within 30 days from date of the election why the meeting did not take place. And the report must contain a new schedule to elect the directors of the corporation. And the schedule of the, meet, of, the, of the meeting should not be later than 60 days from the scheduled date. Now, what happens 
if on the new schedule, wala pa rin quorum. Wala pa rin dumating. Hindi pa rin majority of signing gabalista under this rule. Section 25, no? Uh, you now have the emergency quorum. So whoever are present in that meeting, so whether stock or non-stock, no? the attendance in that meeting will constitute a quorum, even though it's less than majority of the standing capital stock or less than majority of number of members for non-stock operation. You all know that quorum for stock operation is majority of the standing vote capital stock, right? For non-stock, majority of the members of the corporation. So for this emergency quorum uh, purpose or concept, the attendance can be less than majority of the standing government stock or majority of the members, and you have a quorum. They can transact business. Okay, next. Section 24 on corporate officers. Uh, okay, treasurer, of course, required to be a resident. Now, those of you, I uh, understand that some are practitioners, I mean, dumb in attendance are practitioners. You know that uh, under uh, previous SEC regulations, they keep on uh, flip flopping or changing the regulation. Right? Sometimes they would say treasurer must be a resident, sometimes not going to be a resident. So, once and for all, let's decide. So, sabi ng, ng RCC, the treasurer must be a resident of the corporation. Resident. And then it requires the appointment of compliance officer, a compliance officer for those cooperation vested with public interest. Uh, that's why you know they have seminars now on uh, compliance officer because their positions are now required by law for those that are vested with public interest. Okay, what are the qualifications of the president, secretary, and treasurer? Next slide, sir. So the president must be a director, and of course, as such, should be a stockholder. Maybe you can be a director unless you're a stockholder. He must not hold concurrently the position of secretary and treasurer. So you can be both president and secretary, president and treasurer at the same time, unless special law allows you. So there's not a qualification unless special law allows you. But if there's special law, then you can be both president and secretary, president and treasurer. Now, can you be both secretary and treasurer? Yes, it's possible. Now, can you be both chairman and president at the same time? Diba, kung liban lang kayo, siyempre, ikaw pa rin chairman president, di ba? Pero pag uh, you're governed with the code of uh, good corporate governance by the SEC for publicly listed companies, that is, the chairman must be separate from the CEO or president position. But for a non-public listed company, the chairman can be president. Huh? So ang, ang gilang pwede, presidente, secretary, presidente, treasurer, chairman, president allowed except for listed companies. Okay, question. What about president and compliance officer? Can they be held by the same person? Concurrently, if you read the law, silent, di ba? Ang sinasabi lang, di ka pwede, secretary, presidente, treasurer, presidente. But I say that the president cannot be a compliance officer. Because a compliance officer is a full-time job. So based on regulations issued by BSP, by the SEC, a compliance officer is a full-time job. And he ensures that all the rules, all the laws are complied with, including acts of the president. So how can you be both president and compliance officer? Who will check you if you're the president and compliance officer at the same time? So I say, even though it's silent, the president cannot be the compliance officer at the same time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, it's a very interesting question. It's an SC opinion, no? So, uh, can the bylaws designate three presidents, no? Three presidents. Well, you know, we don't have we don't have to answer the obvious. So, as he said, no. President is a very important position. Malilito mga tao kung tatlong presidente mo, no? Dapat isa lang ang presidente ng corporate. So, you can have many vice presidents. Banco de Oro has about 2,000 plus vice presidents, no? But there can only be one president. Next. Okay, now this one is very interesting. Is the corsec of the corporation required to be a lawyer? Hmm? Well, you check the corporation code. Dahil ba sinasabing kailangan abogado? Yung corporate secretary? Wala. Sinasabing lang citizen and president, right? Except, 
except if the corporation is covered by the revised code of corporate governance. So like public companies, listed companies, if the corset is also the compliance officer, he must be, it's preferred that he is a lawyer. Next. Okay, I think I have covered this a while ago. Next, please. Okay, uh, time check, 3.30. Okay, removal of directors or trustees. So this is a new provision. So the SEC is given the authority motu proprio for a verified complaint. No? But of course, after due notice and hearing, uh, in line with the requirements of due process, to order the removal of a director who was elected despite disqualification. Despite disqualification. Okay. Now, my, my only take about this, um, my only take, merong notice and hearing, di ba? Eh, by the time matapos ang hearing na yan, tapos yung term ng director. No? So SEC can order removal if he is not qualified, no? uh, elected but not qualified, he can be removed by the SEC. But given the requirement of notice and hearing, he may outlast the term of, he may outlast his term, the one-year term. True or not? But true. But, but subject to penal sanction. It's one of those acts considered criminal under the RCC. If you elect a director knowing that he's not qualified, Next, let's take a look now. Earlier we talked about emergency uh, quorum. Let's talk about emergency board. So this is under section 28 of the uh, revised corporation code. What's the concept of emergency board? So these are the requisites. First, the remaining directors cannot have a quorum. So the vacancy prevents them from having a quorum. Let's say 15, ay yung 8 nagka-COVID. Huwag naman po sana, uh, example lang. Like a COVID. So seven na lang. So they cannot have a quorum, di ba? Okay. Now, if you only have seven, under the old code, what is your only solution? You have to call a special staff for meeting to fill up those vacancies, right? Because the board can fill up the vacancies only if the remaining directors constitute a quorum. But if there's no quorum, all the staff holders can fill up the vacancies, right? Okay. Now, what if the urgent matters be attended to by the corporation? What will happen now? So the RCC solved the problem by having an emergency board. So emergency action is required to prevent grave, substantial, irreparable loss or damage to the corporation. And then the remaining directors must elect from whom? From whom? Among the officers of the corporation. They cannot elect from non-officers, only from the officers of the corporation. And there has to be unanimous vote from all the remaining directors, trustees. So those officers now become members of the board. Now they, they now have a quorum, right? So they can now act on matters requiring urgent attention of the board. But the term is coterminus with the emergency action that needed to be addressed. Next. On compensation of directors, uh, uh, the RCC clarified that directors should not participate determination of their per diem allowance. Now, per diem allowance is not part of compensation because compensation, as you know, uh, for directors as such can only be given if authorized by the bylaws, right? Or approved by the stockholders only majority of the standing up the stock. They cannot be approved by the board only. Okay? Compensation, like profit share, bonuses, allowances to directors, uh, or housing plan, car plan, they had to be in the bylaws or approved by stockholders or the majority of the sun government staff. What about per dime? Per dime allowance is not compensation. Therefore, it does not need stockholders approval or bylaws provision, right? Under the RCC, however, the board cannot participate in termination of their per dime allowance. What, what does it mean? So if they have to pass a resolution, let's say they will increase the, the per dime, no? Uh, from uh, 10,000 to 50,000 a month uh, for every attendance. It will be prospective in application. It will not cover them. So the same bet, therefore, is 
to have it in the bylaws so that the board can say we do not have a hand in the determination of our program allowance. If it's not the bylaws, the board may fix it, but prospective in application. The, you, you've heard, um, though my students have heard this, uh, the program allowance of San Miguel, PLDT, no? it's, it's not peanuts, about 250,000 uh, for every board meeting. And then on top of that, you can attend to meetings. If you're a board meeting, sorry, if you're a board director, I'm sorry, uh, you are, you will be member also of various committees. There are many committees in the board, as you know, legal oversight, uh, executive committee, compensation committee, audit committee, uh, legal oversight committee, risk management committee, so on and so on. If you're a director, for sure, you'll be a member of a committee. When I was in the board of UCPB, uh, I was in the committee, I was in three committees, despite my being scared, I, I was in three committees. Others had four, five, seven committees. Now do your math. If you are a director of San Miguel, you attend board meeting, you get 50,000. All right. And then um, uh, you, you have three committees, 200,000 per committee meeting. So three times 200, 600 plus 80,000 just for one month. Just for one month. So attend board and uh, committee meetings of the likes of San Miguel and uh, PLDT. It's allowed because the only requirement for per time is uh, reasonable. Most reasonable depends, of course, on the stature of the person, the uh, operations, income of the corporation. Okay, now I would like to um, um, bring your attention to one item under Section 39. Under the old code, it says the aggregate annual compensation of directors, as such directors, must not exceed 10%. Of the net income of the corporation before income tax of the preceding year. So that was clear. The aggregate annual compensation of directors as such directors not to exceed 10% of the net income before income tax of the preceding year. Okay. Under the revised corporation code, they removed the phrase as such directors. What is the implication? Now, in the case of Western Institute of Technology versus Salas, Supreme Court said, the limit that the rule against payment of compensation to directors only applies for payment of compensation for director services. So for director services, it's only allowed if it's in the bylaws or approved by stockholders or the majority of the signing capital stock. But if a director is also the vice president or the president, he can be paid as president and his payment as president is not subject to bylaws provision or approval of stockholders, right? The board or the uh, compensation committee can fix the president's salary, right? So the president's salary is not part of the 10% cap under the old code. It does not include non-director services. The RCC removed that phrase as such director. Therefore, therefore, the compensation of directors for both director and director services should not exceed 10% of the net income cooperation or income tax of the proceeding. Next. Section 31, uh, it expands the cooperative self-dealing provision. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, you all know under section, uh, it was 32 the end of the old code. Uh, if a cooperation contracts with its director, officer, uh, it has to be, it's subject to the following requirements. The presence of director not necessary for a quorum, his vote not needed to approve the corporate act, the vote, uh, the results may be fair, visible under the circumstances. You can dispense with the first two elements. Uh, the presence is not necessary for a quorum, vote not needed to approve the corporate act, as long as ratified by stockholders only two thirds, right, of the standing government stock. And the contract is fair, visible under the circumstances. The, the RCC expanded the self dealing provision to include spouses and relatives up to fourth degree of consequent affinity of directors and the officers of the corporation. Okay, um, so uh, we were engaged by, by a, a big bank. Our law firm was engaged by a big bank to handle a case for them, significant case for them. I was in the board of the bank at that time. So if the bank would contract my services, the self-dealing, right? So I, I should not be present in that meeting. 
my vote should not be needed in that meeting. It has to be fairly simple under the circumference. In that case, I waive my fee. So it's just about under the circumference. Now, RCC, if the contract is between that bank, let's say, and relatives, spouse relatives of mine, then subject the same requirements. All right. Next. On corporate powers, so corporations are now allowed to enter into partnership and joint venture agreement. Old code do not allow corporations to enter into partnership. They can enter joint ventures or back for sanitary wares, but now it's part of the uh, powers of the corporation. It can enter into partnership and joint venture agreement. And then second, very interesting, domestic corporations can now donate in favor of any political party or candidate. The prohibition is only against foreign corporation. But uh, domestic corporations, they, they removed the prohibition on making donations to in aid of partisan political activity. Somebody asked me why. Why, why do you think, sir, that uh, the RC removed it? I, I say, it's being done anyway. We might as well it, right? So that's what I said, no? for joking. Anyway, so it's now part of the powers of the corporation. On power to increase and increase capital stock, uh, there's a period of six months. You have you cannot delay it. Six months from approval of the board, stockholders, you have to file the application with the SEC. Otherwise, it's possible unless you ask for extension. To repeat, if you increase the capital stock of the government, you have to file the application within six months from board and stockholders approval. Otherwise, pass na yun, unless you get extension from the SEC. Okay, moving on to section 39, uh, for sale uh, and other disposition of assets. Well, you all know the rule, if the sale amounts to all or uh, substantially all the corporate assets has to be approved by the board, majority vote at least, stockholders bet is two thirds of the standing capital stock, and the RCC now subject to the approval of the Philippine Competition Commission. Now, the SEC issued an opinion for publicly listed companies so when is a sale considered sale of all, substantially all? It's called down. So pag listed companies, ito ang rule. Okay. If the sale amounts to at least 51%, at least 51% of the assets, computed based on its total assets as shown in its latest audited financial statement. Okay. So for non-listed companies, anong rule? Diba ang rule is, if after the sale, the corporation cannot attain the purpose of its corporation. Then it amounts to a sale of all or substantially all of the corporate assets requiring board approval and stockholders approval. Okay, all or substantially all. Of public listed companies, ang rule lang is at least 51% of the assets of the corporation are being disposed of based on total assets in a short its latest board and financial statement. And also speaking of the, the Philippine Competition uh, Commission, uh, they issued a new regulation. Uh, those of you who are familiar, you have the, the two tests, right? Size of the person test and size of the transaction test. What does it mean? Uh, size, scroll down. There you go. Uh, stop there. March 1, 2019, you have a new norm. So the tests are now 6 billion for size of person and, no, sorry, they increase it 6 billion for size of person, 2.4 for size of transaction. So size of person, meaning the assets of the acquiring or acquired entity, 6 billion, and size of transaction, 2.4 billion at least. If, those, if these two concur, you have to notify the PCC. Otherwise, transaction is void. Okay, next. On content of bylaws, I already said a while ago, uh, the bylaws now may contain provisions on electronic uh, sending of notice, uh, most of attendance of um, stockholders electronically or personal proxy. And it also it can also provide for maximum number of uh, representation for independent director. So how many corporations are you allowed to be independent director? You can be in the bylaws because you can be independent director forever. Right? So the moment you're independent director of one corporation, you will lose independence and you will no longer be independent director. 
So this can be provided in the bylaws also. Okay, uh, on, on point, okay, back, back, back. Back, back. Uh, on contents. Item number one. Now this one, I, this one I find very interesting. On the old code, uh, the bylaws must be submitted prior to operation or within one month, right, from operation. The RCC removed the provision on submission of bylaws within one month from operation, and yet retained the authority of the operation to adopt the bylaws after operation. Now, why do I find this interesting? If we check the website of the SEC on the documents you have to submit before they will act on your application for incorporation, ano yung document na kailangang isama mo doon? Bylaws. Bylaws. So hindi pwede mangyayari sa practice, no? Yung bylaws mo ay eh, after incorporation because the SEC will require the bylaws prior to incorporation. Okay, next. Uh, for meetings, so as you know, um, the bylaws is silent any day after April. You should be any day in April, right? Now, any day after April 15, what's the significance of this? Why do they make it uh, any day after April 15? Bakit di any day in April? Kasi pag any day in April, it can be April 1, April Fool's Day, right? No, just kidding. Uh, so that in time for the submission of the financial statements will be SEC. Okay, one thing about meeting, by the way, I thought that this should be addressed no, in the revised cooperation, but it's not there, so the, the jurisprudence is still true, therefore, the case of Rick Ford was the DECAN 2016. Supreme Court said, if the bylaws specifies the exact dates and time of the annual stock horse meeting, like let's say, third Monday of August, 12.30 p.m. And if that day is a holiday, the next business day is not a holiday. So if the bylaws specifies the exact date and time of your annual regular stockholder meeting, the lack of notice will not vitiate the legality of the meeting nor affect all of the items taken up in that meeting. So even though you're not notified, uh, 21 days before the annual stockholders meeting. If the bylaws has a date anyway, the lack of notice will not invalidate the meeting. Okay, uh, I sit here. Where should the meeting be held? Where should the meeting be held? Under the old code, as you know, it has to be in the, in the city with the principal office located and as far as practical, the principal office itself, right? It's now the other way around under the RCC. The, now, the rule now is it has to be in the principal office of the corporation. And if not practicable, there's the only time you can have it in the city or municipality where the principal office is located. Next. Uh, as I said during the regular meeting of Bakra, uh, sorry, Bakra. As I said, during the regular meeting of stockholders, the board must endeavor to present to the stockholders members minutes of meeting no? uh, certain matters that have to be made known to the stockholders for transparency. Uh, well, you can just take a look. Uh, it's called anyway. But you know, just one interesting anecdote. So I can devote my remaining time for the other topics. Just, just one interesting anecdote. What about attorney's fees? Attorney's fees. Should the corporation report to the stockholders fees it paid to its lawyers? You know, I, I, let me share with you an anecdote. Um, there was one case where one of our adverse parties uh, requested our client, stockholder, no? but belonging to the competing camp, camp a stockholder asking the Corset and the president of our client the amount of our fees, legal fees. And I have I have a feeling, I had a feeling rather, that that stockholder will file a petition uh, or a, an action for derivative suit. I had a feeling that probably he will question the amount that he's being paid to us, no? Probably will say that he's exorbitant and so on. Uh, for there is no exorbitant, excessive fees, so it's all a matter of uh, determination with the client and the law firm. 
Uh, but anyway, so that was my feeling. So what did we do? We filed a petition for declaratory relief with the RTC of Makati uh, for the court to determine whether or not our fees can be subject of inspection by a stockholder. We argued that it is outside of inspection uh, because it's something uh, confidential only between the client and, and our firm. And the RTC of Makati ruled that uh, fees, no, legal fees are, are confidential outside the right of inspection. What about under the RCC? The law says even non orbit fees must be reported to your stockholders. Now, the law doesn't say you report how much you pay to a specific law firm. But the RCC says you have to report even non orbit fees. No? To your stockholders. So I, I, what happened to us that I think is no longer valid now, given the requirements under the RCC. Next. 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 Okay, to 61, consideration of for stocks. No? The RCC added shares of stock in another corporation as allowable form consideration in any other form of consideration that is generally acceptable. I was asked this question. Can you pay your subscription by way of cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. And I say, well, it if it becomes a generally accepted consideration, yes. With the law, the RC allows it now. The law does not say cryptocurrency, but it says generally acceptable form consideration is now valid. So if it becomes generally acceptable later on, then it can be accepted as payment for subscription. And then second, stockholders can now participate in termination of the value of um, uh, property as consideration for issuance of shares. Diba before, Pag ang consideration property, it must be valued by the board, right? Fairly valued by the board. So the approval of the board and the SEC. And the RCC, the valuation determined by the stockholders or the board. And finally approved by the SEC. On 73, as I said, uh, the uh, RCC expanded the list of documents and books that the uh, corporation must keep. No? And fail to keep these documents in the principal office is a crime. It's a crime. Okay, what else is a crime under 73? Violation of right of inspection. Okay. Now, somebody asked me this question. The RCC removed the penalty of imprisonment, unlike the old code, imprisonment or fine or both the option of the court. Under the RCC, just a fine, 10, 20,000, up to 400,000 maximum for violation of private inspection. Therefore, is it correct to say that the RCC decriminalizes or decriminalized violation of right of inspection? And the answer is no. It's still a crime, except that the penalty is simply monetary fine, no longer imprisonment. As you know, under the revised penal code, you can have a crime even though the penalty is only fine, right? If afflictive, corrective, so forth and so on. And there are many laws out there, uh, so many laws, safety, safe space act, uh, use of belt, uh, helmet, where the penalty is only fine. So just because the penalty is a fine, that the person doesn't mean that it's not a criminal offense. Next, please. Next. Next, next. No, uh, back, 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 back. back. Back, 73, 73, sorry, 73. Siba, balik pa. Okay, there you go. So we have mentioned it did not decriminalize. So what are the remedies now of a stockholder? Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, what are the remedies now of a stockholder if the corporation denies, does not act, or does not act on your demand for inspection? You now have three remedies 
Number one, remedy, uh, you can report the denial or inaction to the SEC. And within five days from the order, the SEC must conduct a summary investigation and order the inspection and production of the requested records. Second, you may find a criminal complaint for violation of private inspection uh, under 73 and 161. And third, you can file a petition to inspect corporate records under Rule 7 of the Rules of Intercorporate Controversy. Next. No, okay, okay, back up. Back up. Okay, that, there you go. Stop, stop. Okay, on point number. Uh, back up. Sorry. There you go. There, okay. All right. Uh, uh, number three. Point. Okay, anyway, so yeah, there you go. Stop, stop. Okay. Uh, it's also a new provision. Any stockholder who should abuse his right of inspection shall be liable. Okay. So, with the prejudice provisions of uh, intellectual property and data privacy, yeah, or subject to the rules on data privacy and the IP. So if you abuse your right of inspection, you can be charged likewise. You have this right, but if you abuse it, you can be held liable. And also, uh, this one is worth uh, ex expounding. The RCC uh, prohibits right of inspection for stockholders who represent an interest adverse to the corporation. To refresh your memory, in the case of Gokwe versus SEC 89 SCRA, if a, if a person is in the board of a competing corporation, or a stockholder of a competing corporation, or represents any interest adverse to the corporation, he be disqualified by the corporation, right? So the bylaws may provide this ground for disqualification, conflict of interest. And that provision is held to be valid in the case of Gokong versus SEC. Because uh, sound corporate policies dictate that the person cannot be in the board of two competing corporations. His duty of loyalty may be compromised because he may appropriate important information and leak it out to his other corporation. That's the gist of going away. Now, the RCC goes one step further. Stockholders who are from competing interests can be denied right of inspection. So they have no right of inspection based on the spirit of going away versus SEC. You know, I, I mentioned this to some of my students. You know, Gong Wei, of course, you know, he's now in heaven, uh, builder of an empire. So uh, at one time he had a um, he had a handshake, no, uh, to buy PLDT. He had a handshake with Salim in in uh, Hong Kong to buy PLDT and uh, Smart, but uh, uh, he wanted to have access to the records of uh, PLDT Smart. He wanted to conduct due diligence to determine the exact worth and value of the two companies. But the CEO, at that time, Mani Pangilinan, um, prevented access to the corporate records. So according to him, uh, John Gongwe, at that time, owned Gitel, a telecom company, competes with uh, the Smart. And he may be given access to information that can be detrimental to the interests of PLD Smart. So basically, he was uh, blocked by. Uh, my money, Pangina, the transaction did not push through. The so Dango put up sun, as you know, and made it very profitable. And it ate up the market of PLDT Smart, such that at one point, PLDT had to buy it at a very good price for uh, the Gongway Group. And they're still also in the board no, of Smart. Now, under this RCC, any stockholder of a competing corporation cannot be given access to the books and records of the company. Not just qualified the director's director, but not being given access to the books and records of the corporation. Okay, I also remember just another anecdote. Um, we're, we're counsel for the biggest uh, steel manufacturing company in the Philippines, Steel Asia. At that time, there were three stockholders of Steel Asia, the Go family, uh, the Yao family, also our clients, and then the Tata, Tata Steel, the biggest Indian uh, manufacturing company. Uh, one of the biggest in the world and the biggest, of course, in India. 
So they own 40% of the company. They wanted to inspect the records of, uh, of the company. And uh, if we deny them right of inspection, they may sue our board and confiscatory criminally. At the time, there was criminal, I mean, the, the penalty was imprisonment. If we allow them access, they may get the records, right? And use the same against our corporation. And they also engage the same business. What did we do? We filed a petition for declaratory relief with the RTC and ask the RTC to determine if the request for inspection is made in good faith or bad faith. Because they also own a similar business. And we got RTC judgment saying that they cannot have access to uh, customer uh, records of customer, names of clients, no? uh, suppliers, because these are proprietary information. Uh, RTC was affirmed, we are, we are affirmed by the CA, and then it stopped them, did not appeal anymore to the Supreme Court. And now, un, un, there's a recent case, Supreme Court said, no? uh, Terlai Investment versus ULO. Uh, trade secrets are outside the right of inspection. So trade secrets outside the right of inspection. So, so these items cannot be exposed or given to competing interests and your stockholders. Okay, next, please. Plan of merger or consolidation, uh, just very, very minor revision, or, but important in what sense? The articles of merger should now include the carrying amounts and fair values of the assets and abilities of the uh, constituent corporations. What do you mean by carrying amounts and fair value of the assets? It's like this. Uh, when you do a merger, you have a surviving and the absorbed corporation, right? After the merger is approved by the SEC, the stockholders of the absorbed corporation become stockholders of the surviving corporation, right? Okay. Um, because there will, there will only be one corporation at the end of the day. So the surviving corporation uh, accommodating both the stockholders of the surviving and stockholders of the absorbed corporation. Now the question is, for every one share of stock of the stockholder of the absorbed corporation, how many shares of a surviving corporation, right? So there will be swap. The shares of the defunct or absorbed will be swapped with shares of surviving corporation. Okay, based on an exchange and swap ratio approved by the board, right? Now the RCC says the articles of merger must indicate the carrying amounts and fair values of the assets and liabilities. So the stockholders can determine if the swap ratio is fair. If it's not fair, they may vote against the merger and exercise their operation. Next, please. Okay, go to On purposes of done stock operation, um, well, basically, they, they removed the, remember before, merong batching or staggered term, right? Ng uh, trustees, no? One third, one year. Yung, yung initial trustees, one third, one year. The other one third, two years. The remaining one third, three years. Every there'll be election, right? Uh, so that one third gets removed every year. Not anymore. They remove the batching of uh, or staggered terms of trustees, three years, and otherwise provided by the bylaws of the government. On the solution, uh, this is more, mostly procedural. Um, basically, they reduce the requirements for uh, voluntary solution where creditors are affected. Uh, from two thirds, it reduced the majority of the outstanding capital stock. All right, uh, and then they introduced a new feature about withdrawing a request for resolution or withdrawing a petition for resolution. So even though you have petition for resolution, so if, if no creditors are affected, it's called request for resolution. If creditors will be affected, it's called petition for resolution. Both requests or petition can be withdrawn by same number of directors and stockholders. Anyway, all right, uh, item number four. Uh, this is very, if you take a look at the provisions regarding uh, shortening corporate term, it says that if a term is shortened and that shortened term arrives, ipso facto, the corporation is dissolved, right? Earlier we said, if a term has expired, the corporation may file a petition for the viable corporate season, right? Now, if it is short in term that expires, it's a factor. The corporation is dissolved. So, for original term, 
Now, the money, because you can ask for petition for revival of corporate system. But if it is expiration, shorter term, it's a factor, corporation is dissolved. Okay, next. Yeah, I think I do that already. It is next. Next. Okay, uh, back up. So these are new grounds for the solution of the corporation. So you now have a separate provision or involuntary grounds. All right, uh, number one, of course, under section 21, we discussed a while ago, if the corporation does not organize and commence business, certificate of incorporation deemed revoked, you need to the solution of the corporation. Uh, second one, members so non operation start business but non operation for uh for five years ground to, to revoke certificate of of, of uh, incorporation now these are new receipt of a lawful order lawful order uh dissolving incorporation what are good examples of this so here the sec will dissolve because there is an, an order from a competent court dissolving the corporation sample uh, co de facto cooperation. How do you solve a de facto cooperation through a co warrant proceeding, right? So the court renders judgment in the co warrant proceeding, solving cooperation, that becomes your involuntary ground. Under FRIA, remember, under FRIA, if the order of liquidation is granted by the uh, by the court, what's the consequence? Operation is dissolved and liquidation should be. And then finding with final judgment, cooperation procured fraud, uh, or procured cooperation to fraud. Example would be cooperation misrepresented the purpose of using cooperation, or in one case, the cooperation used fictitious names. So the cooperators used fictitious names. So there was fraud in procuring certificate of cooperation. There's a final judgment dissolving it, of course, cognizance, take cognizance of by the SEC. And something new. Finding uh, by final judgment that the corporation was created for the purpose of committing, concealing, or aiding uh, securities violation, smuggling, tax evasion, money laundering, or graft and graft practices. Next. Or aided in the commission of these violations, or tolerated graft and graft practice acts, or legal acts by the director, trustees, and officers. Now, for these last three grounds, Last three grounds I enumerated smuggling, uh, security violation, graft and corruption. The, um, the SEC may file a petition to forfeit the assets of this corporation in favor of national government. Without prejudice, of course, to rights of innocent stockholders and employees for services rendered. Next. A few more minutes. Uh, okay. What time is it? Oops, okay. Uh, next, please. Um, there are other grounds. Okay. Um, anyway, the, the enumeration, enumeration is not exclusive. There are the grounds to dissolve the cooperation and the PD 902 A. So, anyway, there are many. Uh, it all boils down, boils down to one thing. Violation of any laws, rules, and regulations by the SEC is a ground to resolve the cooperation. Non-submission reports to the SEC ground for the solution of the cooperation. Okay, just my last anecdote. Uh, just a few more slides and we should be done by 4.30. Uh, this refers to UST, our council for UST and uh, University Hospital. Congratulations again to Kenneth Manuel, place six in the bar. Uh, Artemas and Barnes are 18 of them. Congratulations again to all of you. And in this case of UST and USDHI. Um, so UST Hospital Incorporated was organized for the purpose of managing the hospital of the university uh, to separate it from the university. So the uh, well, some officers of the hospital and some Dominican fathers put up in good faith this cooperation to manage US Hospital. 
But unfortunately, uh, for them, there was an instruction from uh, the master of the order to dissolve USTHI. So he got a loan uh, uh, to start the construction of a new hospital. But the loan was aborted, so the master of the order says revoke USTHI. And I was asked, uh, what's the most expeditious way to revoke a, a corporation? I said, uh, others, we can just shorten the term of the corporation. We shorten the term, and when the term expires, if the corporation is dissolved, right? that's the fastest way. So we they approved, and the uh, board of solutions, board of solutions, tower solution passed. Uh, we got approvals to dissolve by shortening the corporate term. Unfortunately, we computed our taxes. They had to pay eight, eight X amount, huge amount uh, for tax clearances. So I was asked, is there any other way uh, to dissolve the USTHI? So I had to tell them, uh, Father, we can do a merger. We can merge USTHI with GST. GST is your surviving operation. And I was asked whether or not merger is a, is a, a mode of dissolution because the instruction given to them for all the way from Rome is to dissolve USTHI. So they have to comply. Otherwise, it's a violation of their vow of obedience. So I was asked, is merger a mode of dissolution? And I say, of course, Father, because in a merger, the, sort of, the absorbed operation is dissolved. It's just excess. There's no, there's no liquidation, but under section 80 then, 79 now, of the RCC, uh, the absorbed operation is dissolved. It's just excess. Right? So they approved the merger. But you know, it takes time because you need to uh, prepare long for audit, so forth and so on until a miracle happened. What was this miracle? We got a letter from the SEC that USTHI has not been submitting its reports and financial statements for the last three years. And unless it submits these reports, it will be dissolved by the SEC. Because I told you, right? Now submission reports is a ground to dissolve the corporation. So I said, go ahead, go ahead and dissolve USTHI. We got this out involuntarily. So when I told the fathers about this, I said, Father, uh, need, need, need. It's, it's, it's a manna from heaven. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And you know what makes it even more miraculous? In case of involuntary dissolution, no need for tax clearance. For voluntary dissolution, you need tax clearance, right? For involuntary, no need for tax clearance. So we got this out. We achieved the objective of the state side. Uh, in the mind that which is different from the intended purpose of the regulation, right? Anyway, so non-submission reports, non-violation uh, of any laws, administrative as a ground to dissolve the corporation. Next, please. A few more slides. Uh, on corporate regulation, uh, this is based on a case, the case of uh, petition for assistance in regulation of the Bank of Bukot Benguet versus BIR. So PDIC uh, took over uh, uh, Rural Bank of Bukod Dengue to carry out this liquidation. So I've been BIR, you cannot liquidate, the sub liquidate uh, the bank because it does not obtain tax clearance. You have to get tax clearance first uh, before you can dissolve and liquidate the corporation. So PDIC filed a client, filed a petition against, uh, B, against BIR, arguing that when it comes to banks, so the rules on dissolution regulation of banks are different from the rules of regulation for private corporations. And the Supreme Court affirmed or the stand of PDIC that when it comes to banks, they're governed by BSP Charter, the General Banking Act. So they can be dissolved and liquidated without having to obtain tax clearance. Tax clearance only applies to private corporations. If the rules otherwise, you will render irresorry the power of BSP and PDIC to dissolve and liquidate a distressed bank, right? So if BIR has a claim, they can participate in the liquidation proceeding, but not to prevent the dissolution and liquidation of the bank. That case now part of the revised corporation. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, on foreign corporation, well, anyway, this is all uh, procedural. It's about uh, increasing the amount of securities uh, you have to deposit securities with the uh, SEC, um, basically to stand as a guarantee for claims being filed against the foreign corporation. Uh, the amount was increased, the value of security increased from 100,000 to 500,000, 
and then the threshold amount increased by 2% from 5 million to 2. Anyway, these are more procedural. Let's move on to the next slide because I don't have time. Okay, this one, as I told you, the RTC now, so the RTC penalizes certain acts on top of right of inspection. So there's, under the old code, there's only one crime, violation of right of inspection. Under the RCC, you have the following, unauthorized use of corporate name, next. Uh, remove, appointing a director despite this disqualification, next. Not keeping records, or have inspection uh, of these records for your stockholder, next. Uh, willful certification or incomplete, inaccurate, misleading statement of reports. Next. Collusion with independent auditor. You, you uh, cook the books of the corporation. Obtaining your certificate of incorporation through fraud. Fraudulent conduct of business. Acting as intermediaries for graft and corrupt practice act. Penalties. Engaging as intermediary for graft and corrupt practice act, tolerating acts of corruption. Next. And then, kung meron nagsumbong sa korporasyon nyo, binaweltahan ng korporasyon, it's also crime. Okay, now, stop that. Under section 170 of the code, it says any other violation of this code punishable by a fine of X amount. Question. Does it mean then that any violation of the code will give rise to criminal liability? Kasi you may you don't pay the balance of your subscription. Are you liable criminally? You don't pay interest on subscription. Are you liable criminally? As a director, you breach your duty. You violated the document of corporate opportunity. You seize a opportunity that belongs to the corporation. Are you liable criminal? Or foreign corporation transact business without license. Is that a crime also? And the Supreme Court said in the case of James E.N.T. versus Tolay Prevon that these acts, while violative of the corporation code, are not criminal offenses. 2017 decision. Not criminal offenses. So therefore, I say this section 170 that learn its lesson from that case of the labor program. So it is not enough basis to say that all violations of the code are criminal in nature. It's only a crime if the law says it's a crime. So there has to be a clear intent on the part of the legislature to criminalize the act, like the acts I enumerated, right? Enumerated by the RTC. Other than these acts, you can take the position based on the labor program case that they are not criminal uh, offenses. Next. Next. Last slide, uh, two more slides. Okay, I made this a last uh, presentation, last slide. One person corporation. One person corporation. It's associated with one of the standout provisions of the RCC. What are the characteristics? Of course, single stockholder, obviously, right? You know, one, uh, one person corporation. Don't say, by the way, one man corporation. That's very sexist. So one person corporation. Not required to have minimum authorized capital stock as provided by special law. Um, no need to submit bylaws, obviously. That you have to indicate letters or PC. Uh, your stock, sole stockholder is also the president. Now, can he be uh, the uh, treasurer at the same time? He cannot be the treasurer. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, he's the president. He cannot be the corporate secretary, rather, of the corporation. Yes, next, please. Okay, uh, back, back, back side, please. No, no, okay. Okay, anyway, never mind. Uh, sige, bakit baba ng kote ya? Okay, I think what is important is this. Uh, the features you can take a look. But here's the important principle behind one person cooperation. He is limited his liability limited to subscription to the one person corporation. The same rule as any ordinary corporation. 
the liability of the stockholders is limited to subscription to the corporation. If you organize then a one-person corporation, your liability is limited to your subscription to that corporation. As long as you do the following. The assets of the one-person corporation and the assets, your assets must be independent. You, have, you can commingle these two assets. Otherwise, they lose a separate legal personality. Second, it must be adequately financed. Third, it should not be used or misused or abused for fraudulent end or purpose. So the same doctrine on piercing bail corporate fiction applies even to one person corporation. So you cannot abuse the notion of separate legal personality for a fraudulent end. The moment you do so, then the personality of the stockholder becomes one with the one person corporation. But for as long as the transactions are legitimate, then your liability as stockholder of that one person corporation, as I said, limited to your subscription. Next, please. So how do you distinguish a sole proprietorship from a one person corporation? Now, given now the rule on one person corporation, it doesn't make sense anymore, right? They organize a sole proprietorship. Why? If you're a sole proprietorship, the sole proprietorship has no separate legal personality from the owner of the business, right? The assets of the sole proprietorship are the assets of the proprietor. The liabilities of the company, the liabilities of the proprietor. Therefore, the liability of the proprietor can go beyond his contribution to the company, right? Pag sole proprietorship. Pag one person corporation, limited to subscription to the corporation. Okay. Next, please. Let me pose this question to you. Can a person organize more than one person corporation? I, I remember uh, acting as moderator. Uh, the IBP UP Law Center organized a, a conference at a time when, when there was no COVID yet. No? Organized a conference. Uh, different lawyers from different parts of, uh, of, of the world came uh, to the Philippines. And the topic assigned to me was, was about um, one person cooperation. We have speakers from, uh, from uh, People's Republic of China, from Malaysia, and we had the General Council of BSP. Uh, because this is not in the RCC, I, I posed the question whether or not you can have a one person, we can have more than uh, one OPC. Let's say one OPC for, uh, for laundry, one OPC for trading, one OPC for different business, so forth and so on. So you're, you're liable only with respect to your subscription in that each in each of the OPC. So according to uh, general counsel, so the RCC is silent. So I we got the the side of Malaysia. Malaysia says it's allowed. China says not allowed. So there is a tie. So the general counsel is of the opinion now that you can have more than one OPC as long as of course you use the same for legitimate legitimate purpose, not fraudulent ends. Next slide. Now for a more uh, comprehensive discussion of the RCC, check out the suit to be launched, question and answers in the revised cooperation code by yours truly. It's about 520 pages, packed with jurisprudence, S opinions, circulars of the SEC, and of course insights from yours truly. So thank you for, for listening. Jaro, can you please turn it off? I'm still on down. Jaro, uh, Jaro, la. Okay, off. Jaro, off and down.
Jero boy. Jero boy, hapat pa ba tayo? Jero.